BYU is preparing to battle Utah State tomorrow night, but they are still making new schedule arrangements for the Big 12 era that begins next year. We'll talk about that. We'll also answer some of your questions that have been coming in this week, as well as some notes on what's going on with BYU and the NFL draft upcoming. So a lot to get to on today's show. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? I'm Jake Hatch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, your resident BYU insider. Thank you for making us here on Locked On Cougars, your first listen of the day. Always appreciate you guys checking out the show. Our goal here is to make you guys the smartest BYU fans in the room. We're very proud to be part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where, of course, the motto is your team every day. And as such, we are your only daily podcast dedicated to all things BYU. Uh, By way of introduction, real quick, my name is Jake. Once again, I work for the KSL Sports Zone in Salt Lake City, Utah, as the executive producer of DJ and PK, and appreciate you once again taking some time to join me to talk all things Brigham Young University. Let's dive in today and talk first off about what's going on with BYU and the Big 12 era upcoming. As mentioned in the open, they're getting ready for Utah State tomorrow night, but that does not mean that the schedule makers are resting on their laurels because BYU announced yesterday they have a new game that's going to be coming up in 2024 against Southern Illinois. Yeah, that's a big-time opponent. Uh, BYU will host the Salukis in a game on August 31st, 2024 at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. Uh, That will replace a game that was scheduled in 2024 against Utah Tech. That game against the Trailblazers has now been moved to September 5th, 2026. So, As I have stated previously on this podcast, I think FCS games are a waste. That's my personal opinion on the matter. But I also understand why teams play them, and BYU is going to continue to do what they do. Now, when it comes to the 2024 schedule for the Cougars, I actually think BYU is kind of going about things in a smart way because they're making sure that they make sure that they have their bases covered when it comes to having opportunities to win games while also making sure that they have uh, the Big 12, obviously, first and foremost in their mind when it comes to the scheduling. As the Big 12 has stated, they're going to go with a nine-game conference schedule once BYU joins the conference in 2023. So currently with BYU in 2024, they have that home game against Southern Illinois on August 31st. Then they have two consecutive road games. Uh, This past weekend uh, against Wyoming, Tom Homo insisting that BYU would make the return trip to uh, Laramie to play at War Memorial Stadium. That'll be on Saturday, September 14th. Sandwiched between those two games will be a rivalry game at Utah. So you're going to play one home game in the non-conference and two road games. That indicates to me that you have uh, plans, or at least you understand if you're BYU, that the Big 12 schedule is going to give you guys five conference home games in 2024. Now, when it comes to the 2023 schedule for BYU, I probably should have pulled this up. I'm going to pull it up right now. It shouldn't take long to load. Yeah. So BYU is going to open up against Sam Houston State. That was previously announced. They also have a home game. Uh, a, I'm sorry, on a road game at Arkansas that season. And they, so they have the two home games in the 2023 schedule. That means that BYU should be set to have four conference home games in their initial season as members of the Big 12, whereas five conference road games. So for those of you out there wondering if BYU is going to lean in, try and go with seven home games or even eight home games, not yet. I think BYU's intent to be a, a good partner in the Big 12, and obviously if they need to play games on the road. They'll go with the traditional six home, six away for the time being. Could I see an era where BYU decides, you know what, let's start trying to be like a USC, a Notre Dame, and start trying to schedule a seventh and maybe even an eighth home game in a season? Absolutely. I'd be all for that, actually. I think BYU fans would love nothing more than to see BYU at home in Lavelle Edwards Stadium than they really would on the road. But that's uh, for another time and place, and obviously that'll bear watching over the coming years. But I really like how BYU's gone about this because if you're going to play these FCS games, great. Give give us teams that have some, I, I don't know how to say it. They, they've got some cachet to them. Uh, so like, like I mentioned, 2023, Sam Houston Bearcats, they are uh, going to be a, a first year FBS program. You're probably thinking, well, they're an FCS team. Yeah, they are an FCS team right now, but they're making the transition to the football bowl subdivision, the same level BYU competes at next year. Then you have Southern Utah the following week for your annual FCS game. And then the week after that, you go to Arkansas. And like we mentioned in 2024, you play the game against Southern Illinois before going 
to Utah and Wyoming. So I think the, the, the way BYU is going about this, they're trying to go with the old, and this was the thing that Chris Hill, the former Utah athletic director, described to DJ and PK, the show I work on on a daily basis once upon a time. He called it an ABC game uh, scheduling when it came to the non-conference with a nine-game schedule, the Pac-12 plays that Utah competes in. He talked about have, always having an A game on your schedule. So in the case of 2023, playing at Arkansas, that's your A game. There's no doubt about that. The B game, okay, Sam Houston Bearcats or Southern Utah, doesn't necessarily scream B game to me, but Sam Houston is a recent FCS champion, so they play a pretty high level of football. Will that translate over to the FBS ranks? Who knows? We'll see if they're like a James Madison. I don't know how many of you know about JMU. They're an FCS powerhouse who made the transition to FBS football this year, and they're undefeated on the year. Granted, they haven't played a murderer's row of games or opponents yet, but they are undefeated in their very first year playing FBS football. And then the C game traditionally is that FCS money game that you play. Now, when it comes to the 2024 schedule, Southern Utah, okay, they're not all that great that you play in 2023, but Southern Illinois, the Salukis coming to Provo, that's a program that's made it twice in recent years, the last two years actually, in fact, that they've made it to the FCS playoffs. I'm not trying to make them sound like they're world beaters because they're not. I'll, I'll be honest, but I, I think it's actually not a bad setup because in that season, speaking of 2024, your A game is the road game at Utah, your B game at Wyoming, C game, Southern Illinois. So I think that's what BYU is trying to follow right now. As I have stated previously, I'd be all for BYU deciding we're not playing FCS games, but at the same time, I understand why you do it. So uh, the other note on this with regards to the scheduling is a game that was scheduled against Nevada, which was supposed to be the season opener in 2024. That has been canceled based on what uh, everything laid out uh, understands. I think FB schedules mentioned that uh, Nevada has scheduled a series against Troy beginning in 2024 that replaces the game against BYU that season. So that's uh, where that Nevada game has gone. It's essentially been canceled, BYU backing out of that and obviously replacing them with Southern Illinois. So uh, I think the scheduling for BYU is going to be interesting. They know that, hey, we, we've, we're up against it. We're making a transition to a, the next level of football in our football uh, playing uh, history. So you have to make sure that you have opportunities to let you guys win games. And we, uh, the interesting part about this, let me add this one, one final note on this. When it comes to the Big 12, BYU has done a really good job trying to prepare as best they can for the day-in, day-out grind of playing a Power 5 schedule. But I, I'm of the opinion you truly won't know every little uh, nuance and what you need to do and how you need to operate until you're actually in the middle of it. There, There is no compensation for actual real-life experience in that circumstance. Can you learn from Utah's transition, from TCU's transition to the Power 5 ranks? Absolutely. Kalani, can Kalani Satake, Elisa Tuiaki, Aaron Roderick, all of which were on Utah's staff when Utah made the transition to the Pac-12. Can they lean on their experience from that transition and help get BYU ready? Absolutely. But I, I just think that there will be certain things that you will not realize that you need to do and or not do until you're ultimately in the middle of it. And we'll see how it all plays out. I, for one, though, cannot wait to see BYU as a member of a conference once again. I was thinking about this, by the way, the other day, that my time covering BYU pretty much coincides with the entirety, prof professionally. I, like, I grew up a BYU guy. I don't know how many of you, of you out there uh, know about my background, but I grew up in Orem, Utah. BYU was the school of choice around the Hatch household. I went to BYU, et cetera. But now that I've been covering BYU professionally in my day-to-day -day responsibilities, in my job, uh, it's funny enough, I started that the very year BYU professionally, my very first full-time time covering full-time time anyways, but my, my first full-time gig was covering BYU as an independent. So I've never really covered BYU as a member of a conference race. I have cheered for them during their time as members of the mountain West and the WAC conference. And it changes things when, when it comes to the actual conference rate conference race annually they'll be gone are the days of oh you really lost a game their season's over blah 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 that, that stuff's done it's dead and gone after this season and uh, i think the fun part will be in the middle of a conference race and okay we play let's say we play ucf this week well if we beat ucf and this team does this that helps us move up and gives us a chance potentially at this it, the the moving parts when being part of a conference race there's nothing like it, and I, for one, cannot wait to see that uh, unfold. All right, coming up here in just a minute, I had a couple of questions sent in this week. And I'm not going to be really a full mailbag on this week's edition because of a compressed schedule. Obviously, BYU getting ready to play Utah State tomorrow, so not as much time uh, to blather on. I, 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 me blather on. You guys blather on. But me blather on about your questions. We'll get to those here in just a moment. And then we also need to talk a little bit 
about what's going on with BYU and the NFL draft. We'll get to all of that after we talk about our friends over at Bet Online. They are your number one source for all of your bet- football betting information this season, my friends. Final latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth articles and analysis on every game that you can find out there, both in the college and NFL ranks. And as always, Bet Online remains your continued source for all of your sports wagering information. They have got live betting, up to minute scores for every sport out there. It is the fastest and the easiest way to check in on all of your favorite games and events, including Major League Baseball, MMA, boxing, golf, NBA hoops beginning this weekend, my friends. The preseason's underway. If you're a real de- degenerate, you can get on, on the NBA action. Head to Bet Online right, right now or use your mobile device to learn more. That's Bet Online, where the game starts. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Always appreciate you guys checking out the show. It's a ton of fun uh, to sit down every single evening when I typically record these and talk about the Cougars. And the nice part is, the news does not stop, but you guys also help uh, pump this, and that's what I appreciate uh, for you guys doing that. Now, a couple of questions here that were sent in, uh, kind of, I guess, an abbreviated mailbag for a moment here. Uh, let's first off talk about a question that came in via Ethan on our Twitter feed, uh, on my Twitter feed, on our email account. I apologize. We're going to get to one on the, on the Twitter feed here in just a minute from our good friend Mojo. But on in an email, Ethan reached down and said, Jake, you talked about uh, the BYU wide receiving core stepping up and every other game having a big guy step up. He said, that's a great thing. But you also mentioned in a tweet that BYU, you never quite know what to expect from the running backs groups, and you're not exactly sure what to expect from them moving forward. Because we all know that Miles Davis had his breakout game for BYU against uh, against Wyoming. Obviously, who could be that person against Utah State? We had Chris Brooks show out against USF, etc. So that's the thing about this. Who is the next running back? And he asked... Jake, what are the chances that Jackson McChesney could could be in the mix for this? Now, I, I put out a tweet. I, I, as I said, he he quoted that. And the tweet uh, did mention that could Jackson McChesney be the next breakout guy for BYU in the running back room? A couple of you responded to that tweet saying, I've heard Jackson McChesney it might be on the shelf. Well, I started digging around, asking some people, and you're right. So credit to you guys out there, you internet sleuths out there. We did see him get injured against uh, – it was against uh, – who was it? it was against Baylor originally got injured and then he re-injured it against Oregon based on what I understand. And as of now, based on what I'm understanding, it is a season ending injury. He had surgery. that's going to knock him out for the rest of the year. So Jackson McChesney, his career is just full of stops and starts. Think about the different chance times he's come into games. He had the freshman rushing record against UMass way back when. He comes in in the Navy game, finishes that game off with a flourish in 2020. USC last year, we'll never forget that. He comes in and punches in a late touchdown to help seal the win for the Cougars in the Coliseum. But it's just been a bunch of stops, spurts, and starts for a guy like Jackson McChesney. But he is on the shelf once again, having season-ending surgery based on people I talked to about that. And it's unfortunate because I thought McChesney would be a guy that absolutely could factor into this into the quarterback, uh, not the quarterback, the running back uh, race if he were healthy. And when he's been healthy, he's had opportunities. But it's just been unfortunate that injuries have precluded him from really getting any type of consistent playing time at this point in his career. The good news is for a guy like Jackson, he still does have two more years of eligibility remaining. So should he... Uh, continue to play football, uh, he will obviously continue to factor into that race. The only problem is, similar to the Tyler Algier situation, let's just say a guy like Miles Davis takes this running back job and seizes it and doesn't ever let it go. Well, a guy like Jackson McChenney's got to be thinking, okay, that guy's younger than me. In terms of playing time, what are what are, what are are my options? What are my realistic options out there? So that's, that's the tough part for a guy like Jackson McChesney because there's just so much promise there because we've all seen it like i said in just these glimpses they're like glimmers of a gem that you see out there every so often then like it fades away and you can't find it again for a minute and then you find it again and it, it, you get what i'm talking about the analogy and that's that's the unfortunate part for a guy like jackson mcchesney so as it stands right now the top three running backs and on BYU's depth chart this week they've got oars all next to their name it goes christopher brooks lopini K- K- katoa miles davis with or 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 so all co-starters three of them at running back for byu if you wanted a fourth running back in that scenario now with jackson mcchesney on the shelf i'd probably say that hinkley ropati the junior college transfer is in the mix there he's probably the number four running back but it's unfortunate for a guy like jackson mcchesney to have been ruled out so early in this because I really think, similar to the wide receiver situation, if he were healthy, he'd have an opportunity to potentially break out in a game like this against Utah State. But 
Such is fate for a guy like Jackson McChesney. All right, next question coming in from our good friend Mojo here. I'm going to pull this up here. He sent this in on Twitter. Actually, DM'd me. It says, I got a question if you do a mailbag this week. So we're doing the mailbag for you, Mojo. It says, they mentioned a couple of times during the broadcast that Jaron Hall was, a, was seventh on Mel Kuyper's QB draft watch list. So I was wondering who you thought you could put, put, could put uh, I was wondering who you thought he could potentially jump on that list. It's a very interesting list here. So he, he actually sent me the, the link. And this comes out from a few months ago. So CJ Stroud's number one, Will Levis from Kentucky, number two, Bryce Young, the defending uh, Heisman Trophy winner, number three, Anthony Richardson from Florida, number four, Tyler Van Dyke, Miami, number five, Cameron Ward from Washington State, number six. And then there's Jaron Hall at BYU. Well, I can tell you this much, Mojo, and you you mentioned this. You said, my thought, he says that Stroud, Levis, and Young have looked really strong this year. Good chance they stay on top. And that's exactly what most NFL draft analysts out there, Todd McShay, who works with ESPN and uh, Mel Kuyper, says the clear-cut top three, C.J. Stroud, Bryce Young, Will Levis. So you're not wrong. Mojo, you're right, on, you're right in lockstep with the national uh, national folks. So there's a good chance they stay on top. Past that, he says, Anthony Richards looks, uh, looks super weak since the Utah game. He's very much been up and down. I agree. Tyler Van Dyke was benched this past week, and Cameron Ward has been sharp, but I feel like he showed less upside than Jaron this season. He says, unfortunately, I also think Hendon Hooker, who is at number eight on this list, just behind BYU's uh, Jaron Hall, might jump him with how well he's been playing. Do you have any thoughts? Well, I can tell you this much. Yeah, I think that absolutely Jaron Hall jumps both Cameron Ward. Uh, we jumps Cam Cameron Ward, Tyler Van Dyke, and Anthony Richardson for me. So he is on my list. He's probably number four on that list. I think Hendon Hooker is in the mix. Tanner McKee, once upon a time, a guy that BYU fans were clamoring for. BYU is very much in the mix to bring him in from Stanford. He's at number nine. He probably moves up on that list. But the good news is, I think for a guy like Jaron Hall, people are starting to sit up and pay attention because Todd McShay in his tweet also says that uh, Tyler Van Dyke and Anthony Richardson are loaded with traits but have disappointed. Talking to NFL scouts, these QBs are rising fast. BYU's Jaron Hall, Tennessee's Hendon Hooker, and Fresno State's Jake Hayner. Jaron Hall is making a move, folks. I, I I think that the biggest thing for him right now is to continue his consistent play. If he continues to play the level he's playing at right now, he's over 1,100 yards. He's completing passes at an astronomical clip, and he's doing it, by the way, without his top two receivers. Now, we understand that uh, Gunnar Romney will return to action on Thursday. Very much looking forward to that. He confirmed it with his own uh, thoughts to Jake and Ben on the KSL Sports Zone, the station I work for uh, yesterday. So good to hear from him that hey, he's planning on playing and he's excited to get out there. You can tell he's chomping to the bit if you listen to that interview. This is a guy who's been on the shelf for a long time and He's looking forward to it. By the way, he did mention he got injured on the third day of training camp, and uh, he confirmed that the pass that they showed on social media where he went up, and I think it was D'Angelo Mandel uh, pl playing in coverage on him, he went up to try and catch that ball and kind of got tangled up and came down, and you see if that highlight. I don't know if they kept it. I think actually they deleted it after the outrage about all this, but he came down and landed on the football. He admitted that he that was what did, did him in. That was the injury that lacerated his kidney, which just sounds absolutely horrific. Terrific to think about, by the way, to have a guy like Gunnar Romney have a lacerated kidney, have anybody have a lacerated kidney, especially when those are type of injuries that happen in car wrecks, not playing football. But he confirmed that he's going to be back. So a guy like Jaron Hall having one of his top two options back for the very first time this season, what more could he do with his top receiving, one of his top receiving options out there on the football field? Obviously losing a guy like Puka Nakua, who I just, I don't know any inside info on this. I don't expect him to play against Utah State, but who knows if he makes a miraculous recovery. I, I don't know. But regardless, having a guy like Gunnar Romney out there should give Jaron Hall yet another weapon to throw the football to. He has been spreading the wealth around. He has hit, I think it's is it 13 or 14 different receivers so far this year, have caught passes from him. He is balling out, and he's doing everything that he needs to do to continue to be a guy who's going to be a factor when it comes to the NFL draft. And I, I think that absolutely, if I, I call me a homer, if you will, but I think Jaron Hall, in my opinion, yeah, behind uh, C.J. Stroud, Bryce Young, and Will Levis, I'd put Jaron Hall number four there. Does that mean he's a first-round draft pick at this point? All it takes is one or two teams to think, okay, this guy's really got what it takes, and he could be the guy for us. And for them to jump up and decide first round is for them to go and take a guy like Jaron Hall, but. 
He's making himself some money right now, folks. He was already a guy that I thought was going to be an NFL draft pick. That that was like a, a done deal for me. I thought it might have been like a, a mid-round pick coming into the season. But the way he's playing right now, just continue to watch this. You're going to see start to see more people when they talk about the NFL draft. They're going to start to see him rise as he, as he continues to impress with his ability. The one thing he's flashing right now is the ability to attack all parts of the field with his arm. And the one thing about Jaron, he's very savvy and patient in the pocket. That's one thing I've really noticed in watching the four games view he's played this year. He doesn't get rattled very easily. And the thing is, he comes off of a play. He kind of scans the field, identifies where the defense is at, and then he fires strikes. That's the thing about this. This is not him just jumping back, three-step drop, and like, okay, first read, throw. Like, no, he will take his time. And the nice part is the offensive line, for the most part, has given him the requisite time to be able to sit back there and pick teams apart. In many ways, I actually feel like BYU's philosophy philosophy under Jeff Grimes and Aaron Roderick has been to run to set up the pass. This year, I may advocate for them to pass to set up the run just because of the ability for Jaron Hall to make life miserable for opposing teams. Why wouldn't you use that weapon? Like Utilize it to the ultimate that you possibly can. Obviously, you want to make sure that he stays healthy and he's available for the entirety of the season, if at all possible. And so far, I've seen no ill effects of any particular big hit. He hasn't really taken any big hits, it feels like, this season. So that's a very positive sign. If you're a BYU football fan, big ups to Mojo once again. He is a fighter pilot uh, serving our country overseas. So, Mojo, uh, I say this all the time, but thank you for your service uh, for our country over there and protecting our freedoms. All right, uh, coming up here in just a minute, we need to talk about uh, an interesting new wrinkle in the Don Staley situation with BYU women's basketball, as well as an injury for the men's basketball team that I think is a little bit of a bummer. We'll round out today's show with those notes coming up in just a minute. Before we do that, though, do need to talk about our friends over at Intercap Lending. There's a reason that no hit lender in the state of Utah is helping more families here than our friends at Intercap Lending. And the reason why Intercap, they get deals done, my friends. They feature a quick and simple process. They close loans two weeks faster than the industry average. And right now, we all know the interest rates are continuing to rise. If you still need to get in on the action, do it with our friends at Intercap. Uh, our personal loan officer over at Intercap Lending, Steve Carter, has been helping hundreds of locked on listeners since 2018. And they love nothing more than to help you guys out as well. Even if you just have a question about what the rates are, he'd be happy to answer answer those for you guys. So you can reach out to him anytime. He'd love nothing more than answer any of your questions to get you started on the way to a refinance, cash out, uh, buying a new home, building a new home, no matter what the situation might be. Intercap can help you do that. Give Steve a call. His direct number, 385-800-8528. That is 385-800-8528. You will not find a more responsive loan officer. I can promise you that. The best part is if you mention Locked On Cougars and Catch, you get a corporate rate discount from our friends at Intercap Lending. And this is not a fly-by-night mortgage company, my friends. they got 44 years of experience behind them. They were founded in 1978, and they are based here in Utah but also capable of helping you in states nationwide. So if you guys need anything, even if you don't live here in Utah, Intercap Lending is happy to help you guys out. Reach out to Intercap Lending. Once again, reach out to Steve, 385-800-8528. Go to intercaplending.com to learn more there. That's Intercap Lending, NMLS number 190465. Intercap Lending is an equal housing lender. All right, before we go here on today's show, two basketball notes for you guys as we round out the show. First thing is BYU women's basketball. Obviously, I got into a little bit of a tussle and a kerfuffle, obviously, with uh, South Carolina. And the first-year head coach, Amber Whiting, for the women's basketball program was eager, I would imagine, to open up her uh, debut season by facing off against the defending national champion, South Carolina Gamecocks. That's a that's a fantastic place to open up your your career as BYU's head coach, probably going up against it with a team that's probably not necessarily equipped to to beat them. But at the same time, it's a big stage for your team to compete on you because you can point to that and say, okay, that is what we're aspiring to be here at BYU. But the bigger thing I think for BYU is now that they will actually get some money out of this because Don Staley, the head coach of South Carolina, made a big old uh, kerfuffle about BYU and the Rachel Richardson situation with BYU volleyball saying that, well, she didn't feel like it was the right time for BYU and South Carolina to play. As I said, it's just a, a veiled way for her to take a shot at BYU while at the same time avoiding having to make a return trip to Provo, Utah with her squad. She doesn't want to travel that far. I, 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 I think that is the overarching thing right now. Can she take a shot at BYU while doing it? Absolutely. And that's exactly what she's doing. But 
the nice part is BYU is going to get some significant change out of this. Under a new uh, contract amendment that was uh, obtained by KSL.com, Sean Walker, a good friend of the podcast, did this. The two-game contract will uh, get BYU $100,000 out of this after South Carolina canceled it within a 90-day window that was re- that required that amount of money. The series actually originally had a cancellation cost for $25,000, no guaranteed compensation uh, for the visiting team in each home game other than the limited number of tickets being given to them. But a new amended contract dated May 27th had a new cancellation clause that uh, called for the breaching party to pay the non-breaching party. So in this case, South Carolina to play B to pay BYU $100,000 in the event of a cancellation within 90 days of the effective termination date, which was exactly what happened here. So BYU getting some nice coin out of it. Obviously you'd like to be playing that game if at all possible, but you know what? If you're going to bilk them for hundred thousand K, hopefully you can uh, throw a party for BYU women's basketball to get ready for their upcoming season. All right. Uh, final note here is Trevin Nell uh, officially announced uh, during BYU's televised uh, practice on Monday evening that he is out three to four months. He had rotator cuff surgery and that's a, that's a tough break for a relatively young BYU basketball squad. Nell was figuring to be a guy who probably had a chance at starting this year. was going to be BYU's hopeful sharpshooter. One of the sharpshooters from the perimeter for BYU. And for him to be on the shelf for three to four months, so we're looking now, okay, it's all, it's the end of September right now. So you dole that out. That brings him back potentially in the middle of, uh, well, not the middle. It'd be the end of uh, non-conference play, the beginning of West Coast Conference play. Does he want to play half of a season? Is, is that worth it to him? And if he has any complications with that recovery, how long do you go before you decide, you know what, maybe we should redshirt you this year, petition for another year of eligibility from the NCAA and try to get you back next year? That, that is my big question for a guy like Trevin Nell. I know this about Trevin. If he's at all capable of playing, he's similar to Gavin Baxter. Remember Gavin Baxter came up, came back for what was it, two or three games uh, for BYU burning a redshirt, and it was, he, he burned a year. Uh, to do that because he wanted to be a team player. Well, Trevin Nell, I think if he is able to, and he's cleared by the doctors and he feels up to it, I think he will retake the court as soon as humanly possible. And that could be the start of West Coast Conference play and hopefully help his team uh, make a run in their final season in the West Coast Conference. But just a a tough break for a guy like Trevin because this is supposed to be one of his, uh, probably his swan song, I would imagine. He's been at BYU for four years now. So you would imagine he wants to go out and have a very successful senior season, play a full complement of games, hopefully score a bunch of points, make a bunch of shots and make memories that'll last him a lifetime. But as it stands, he's going to be on the shelf, but he's just mentioned the fact that he's now become like, they call him the shot doctor where he's helping guys out by getting their shots up in practice. And he has continued to rehab that shoulder, but just a tough break because he battled through that the entire year last year. And the hope was that they could avoid surgery and get him back to full health. But eventually all options failed and he had to undergo the knife. And that, that's a tough deal. So I, I wish him the best. Uh, speaking of uh, Trevin Nell, the nice part for the BYU men's basketball program, just kind of the brief glimpse at practice, there's some athleticism on this team. Uh, you can very much tell that it's going to be a very young team. This is kind of the anti uh, uh what am I trying to say? The anti-Mark Pope squad. Like he's always had pretty much senior and junior laden squads so far in his BYU career. He's got a lot of freshmen and sophomores and transfers who have extra years of eligibility remaining on their uh on their eligibility clocks coming into this program. So this is a little bit of I think a long play for a guy like Mark Pope. He understands this is the final run through the West Coast Conference. You can you're you're not gonna win the West Coast Conference. They've got Drew Timmy up there at Gonzaga once again. He's the preseason national player of the year. Like they're the, the hopes of upending Gonzaga, which will be a disappointment, the fact that BYU was never able to win the West Coast Conference in all their years in the WCC, but at the same time, I think this year you can afford, if you're Mark Pope, to say, you know what, this is a little bit of a rebuild year. We're going to let guys like Richie Saunders, Dallin Hall, guys coming off of missions to get themselves into shape because really – the future for us is in the Big 12. This is a staging ground. The final year of the West Coast Conference, yes, you want to be competitive. You don't want to finish in fifth place like you did a year ago. That was a massive disappointment considering the the, the what things BYU was trying to do with the transfer portal last year. But you, you want to stay competitive this year, but at the same time, you have you kind of got that eye forward. You got that 30,000-foot view saying, you know what? Yeah, this is our final run here in the WCC, but our future, it's in the Big 12 and maybe the best basketball conference in the country. We've got to be ready for that. And this may be the year that you take some of those lumps where you play some of these young guys, get them all of that game experience with the thought that when you get into the Big 12, you'll be further ahead had you uh, decide, 
that you'd be further ahead when you go in there with those younger guys who have experience versus being like, all right, we had a senior laden squad use the transfer portal to, to prop ourselves up. And we started all right back over going into the big 12. I actually think this is a pretty smart play by Mark Pope and his staff to kind of go on that, 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 I don't know how to say it exactly. The, the kind of the long play versus the immediate dividend of potentially uh, being the second or third team in the West Coast Conference this year, making a run at the NCAA tournament. Is an NCAA tournament run out of? Is an NCAA tournament run out of the question right now? No, it's not. I think they could make a run at it this year, but it's going to have to have some of these young guys step to the forefront and really become the players you think they can be earlier on in their career, maybe than you anticipated. So. There's kind of that both sides of the coin here for BYU basketball, but not having a guy like Trevin Nell in the lineup, that is going to hurt you if you're BYU. All right, that'll do it for us. A big thank you once again for making us your first listen of the day. Always appreciate you guys checking out the show. Please continue to subscribe, rate, review, like the show, mash that follow button on YouTube. Do whatever you need to do to support the podcast and also share it with your family and friends. Word of mouth is absolutely critical to our continued success here on the podcast. So thank you once again for making us your first listen. Now go make our friends over the Locked On Big 12 podcast your second listen of the day. Josh Neighbors does an incredible job making sure you're apprised of everything going on in the Big 12 Conference in 30 minutes or less. Check that out free and available wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube, just like this show. That'll do it for us. Have a great rest of your day. Tomorrow's game day, my friends. Get your predictions in now. Send them in on social media. We'll do a full preview of that matchup on tomorrow's podcast, what to expect from Utah State in the battle for the old wagon wheel. Got that for you guys tomorrow. This has been the Locked On Cougars podcast. See ya.